Shadiverses. Greetings, I'm Shad, and this is a rather important episode that I'm doing right now because it's quite a fundamental basic question. What was life like in the medieval period, or just in medieval castles? What was it like living in a medieval castle? And I've avoided addressing it because the more I look into it, the more complex a discussion and question I find it to be, and the more nuance there is, and I've just been hesitant because I was worried that I couldn't address the subject properly enough. The issue is there are many other, you know, people making videos uh, on this subject who unfortunately do a very poor job and spread a lot of misinformation. And I realized, well, I can at least do a better job than what's already out there. In actual fact, the prompting, the, the final kind of kick to do this video was in response to another video I watched recently on what life was like in Medieval Castle, and there was a lot of incorrect facts, misinformation and stuff. And like I say, every time I do a reply video, and this isn't really a reply video, it's just more prompted by another video, but even, even though it's not like that, I always have to say, I don't hold anything against these people. I've held so many of these misconceptions before, I've spread these misconceptions in the past, and I actually like that people are making videos about the Medieval Period because what it usually does, it creates the cat list for people to learn the correct information, like me making this very video. So even like the reply I did to Matt Pat's video about knights, samurais and vikings and all the misinformation he made in it, I'm really glad he made the video. And I know he tries his best, I know that these people who did life in the council tried their best. So uh, look, don't hold anything against them, they, they get things wrong. So now let me explain the thing that lead most people to make mistakes about medieval times, life, what they did, what it was like in Castle, and all those things. And it generally comes down to one big mistake, okay? And it's when they hear or learn about a practice or something that happened at some specific location at one specific or maybe a few specific times within the medieval period and then assume that was how it was done for the whole medieval period across all of Europe. And that's wrong. This is what I mean about the greater nuance I have found when studying, you know, more about this time period. And I love this time, it's, it's great, okay? And the more I look into it, the more sophistication I discover. I realize that, huh, things were different between Britain and Spain, and medieval Germany, which is the Holy Roman Empire, but you know, medieval Germany, to Italy, to France, to Bohemia. Like, they all have different practices, okay? And then, same with styles of castles and stuff. And separate to differences from geographical location, things changed in the time period as well. Things were different in 1100, you know, AD, in the medieval period, compared to 1400, okay? Things change and evolve. It's a, it's a long time period. I myself regard the, the real medieval period to happen between 1000 AD and 1500 AD, okay? The broader kind of, uh, you know, classification of the medieval period starts at 500. AD, but castles were, like, like, there's a period of 500 years where castles weren't around, knights really weren't around and stuff, and, you know, if you really want to look at the iconic, iconic medieval period, it really starts at around 1000. Yet even there, that's a space of 500 years, okay, and things change. So I want to address some of the big misconceptions people say this was just the medieval period and share the context okay uh, the nuance uh, as best I can I'm still learning all right there are still things that I don't know about I might still have erroneous misconceptions that I haven't corrected yet but of course as you know when I find that I've spread something wrong I correct myself I'll start off with the idea that castles were dark dank and cold and when people say this they say all castles within the whole medieval period were dark, dank, and cold. And no, okay, sometimes, yes, but not all the times. I mean, again, nuance, all right? There, there's a lot of different types of castles in the medieval period, okay? And there are some castles, okay? One of the reasons why they're, they're given the stigma of being dark is that having a large window on a castle is a big defensive weakness. It means the enemies can climb through. And so all the windows facing the outside of the castle, like where the enemy can actually reach and get access to, they're very small, very thin, usually only arrow loops. And in these instances, there's not much sunlight going to be let in. 
But then you get castles that have an internal bailey, and then they might have really large gothic style windows facing the inside that would let in plenty of light. There are so many examples of decent sized windows on castles that will let in a decent amount of light. The other big kind of misconception that people get about this where they think castles in particular are dark, okay? Not really more so than many of the homes of the medieval period. What do I mean? There is another issue with windows, just aside from being a defensive weakness for castle defense and stuff. It's that they let out a lot of heat, okay? And with the type of winters you can get in Europe, especially Britain, that's a big problem. And so a lot of just regular homes in medieval period, cottages and stuff like that, had very few windows to keep in the heat. Some only had like a grate like this, and that's it. And then they might have two openings on either side. If you're looking at like a thatched roof, more, you know, early, again, Differences in time period. If you go further back into the medieval period, you're going to find less windows. You're going to find less windows on cottages, separate to castles, just generally, okay? Because you go further back, all right, yeah, yeah they have kind of wattle and daub, thatched roof home, barely a single window on it to keep in as much heat as possible. So when you go inside, it's really dark. When it came to situations like that, people spent time outside, okay? Far more so than we did. And the other thing about being dark on the inside, they did have candles. Even in the daytime, if you have a, a, a room that's not letting in a lot of light, you can light a candle, okay? And then when we go a bit later on in the medieval period, there was a couple of different practices that arose to help windows be put on homes to let in more light and things like that. So they had larger windows and usually would it, because glass was very expensive. So you could get kind of the, you know, uh, framed glass, either stained glass or the, the classic diamond pattern because making glass in large sheets was a problem. They had to make it in smaller things and that's why the classic kind of medieval windows are made out of um, diamond patterns and stuff because they are very small and they weren't clear they, they had they because it wasn't a consistent um, craft at that time and so if you look through these glass windows even as clear as they could make them it would be very warped and everything but not everyone could afford that and so if you couldn't afford it your windows would generally just have wooden planks okay kind of like you're looking through uh, bars in a prison and they would have wooden shutters on the outside that they were closed in the daytime, open up in the nighttime. But if you're in the winter, okay, you're not going to have those windows open because it's going to let out all the heat of the inside. So it's going to be closed and you're not going to have much light on the inside anyway. So you'll rely on candles during the daytime and fireplaces. Fire. Okay. This comes into the other misconception about castles being cold. Okay. Cold was a problem that people had to deal with, not just in castles, but in just medieval living. And so this idea that castles were specifically cold and everything else wasn't is again inaccurate. And the way people combated the cold was with fire. And of course, fire creates light as well. And so you get light on the inside of these castles. And there we go. And again, with fire creates warmth and comfort. Now, again, depending on time period, uh, you will find different castle designs with a lot of fireplaces and some with very few, maybe only in the Great Hall or the Lord's Chambers and stuff. Sometimes the Lord's Chambers wasn't the Great Hall. I, if you want to get an idea of what was inside a medieval castle, check out my video what's inside medieval castles to get an idea of the layout and you'll be surprised at how few rooms really exist in the medieval castle the standard one they got bigger and with fewer rooms meant less fireplaces needing to be built in the structure because there was only a few rooms, so you only need a few fireplaces to create the warmth in those rooms to make it more habitable. But even if we go into a later period, the this idea, fireplaces create warmth, comfort, and everything was quite prominent, and so fireplaces were put in as many rooms as possible. Have a look at Bodium Castle, okay? One of the things that you'll see on Bodium Castle are fireplaces that are built structurally in, the walls are thick, okay? About a meter thick, or two meters in some cases, which is ample room to make an alcove where you can fit a fireplace in, and there are heaps of fireplaces in so many of the rooms on Bodium Castle. This is just one example. Would other parts of the castle be cold? Well, if there wasn't a fireplace, of course, but that could be an advantage sometimes because if you want to keep food cool, well, sometimes uh, they would dig like an actual kind of cellar in the ground of a castle where it would be really cold and that's where they would try and keep food and stuff. That wasn't the case in all, okay, uh, castles and everything. Just one practice that I have learned about. And this is what I mean about my hesitation of addressing the subject because even though I've learned of this practice, I know it was done where they dig kind of a cellar into the ground that kind of looked like a cave sometimes it'll be light or sometimes it wasn't and stuff I haven't learned 
how prominent it was through all the different time periods within the medical period and the specific geographical locations because it obviously wasn't done over the whole thing but this is what people generally do they hear one thing and they're like that's what it was done in all the medieval period but the medieval period is a very long time and covers a very large geographical region it wasn't just blanket that's it this video is really me addressing a lot of the misconceptions that are brought up when people say life is like this in the medieval period or medieval castles and stuff so unfortunately it's not going to paint a clear kind of picture of what life was like I'll try and do my best and address some things that I can share that isn't specifically to correct other things, but I do want to correct the misconceptions first and foremost, because those are the most important things to address in my opinion right now. And there's more I need to talk about in regards to castles being cold, and it comes into the idea of stone having very poor insulative properties, which is true. But the thing that people miss is that castle walls are usually at least a meter thick, if not more. And so if you have something with poor insulative properties. Uh, you can get a, a certain level of insulation if you just make it thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker, okay? The thicker you get, the more insulation properties, and it gets to a point where, okay, it's it's half decent, all right? It's not, it's not great, it's not nearly as good as we can make in the modern day, but it's not nearly as bad as people think. The next big misconception that is spread so often in the medieval period is regarding drinking water, okay? Uh, I've heard this a lot uh, in many different documentaries and many YouTube videos and stuff like that where they say the water was so bad in the medieval period that it was contaminated you'll get sick and drinking it so everyone drunk ale <laughs> just uh, let's if we could slow down and just really process that i mean you can debunk this just by thinking about it. it's like really for, for uh, at least 500 years if not a thousand years for all of medieval europe people weren't drinking water and they were only drinking ale no, it's just, the idea is true, of course not, okay? People drink water, and what they do is they test if the water is clean or not. If the water is clean, they have a clean water source, and they will drink it, okay? Now, having said that, water is nice, we need water to live, but we do enjoy flavoured drinks, okay? And so, of course, all throughout the medieval period, people were making wine or mead or ale, oh, of course, okay? A lot of them were far less alcoholic than we might assume, and then there's the idea that people are aware of what alcohol does, okay? And so, people generally, this is where it gets really bad, when they take one thing that did happen and then apply it to the whole medieval period across all medieval Europe, okay? Uh, then they think, well, if that's the case, everyone must have been drunk all the time and then they say in the medieval period everyone was drunk no of course not people aren't stupid they know what being drunk is like and they know you know i'm going into battle i might not want to be drunk i need to use my head i might not want to be drunk in this circumstance they're not going to say oh well because there's no water anywhere i just have to drink ale and get drunk anyway no and you know the other thing even if the water is slightly contaminated you boil it okay and then it's good for drinking i mean my goodness all right so why were some waterways contaminated in the medieval period well animals do their business in water okay so even if you don't have humans throwing their own feces in it, if there's a chance that it might be contaminated just off the bat. But when you have that, and again, one of the main ways of waste disposal in the medieval period was chucking it in waterways. Not in all cases. Sometimes they just dug a pit in the dirt and buried it. Problem solved, okay? And if they needed to create a kind of communal privy or whatever, they just dig really low, drop dunny or whatever, and do that. In. <laughs> and they weren't always communal either. So this is one, one a more recent video where they're always communal. No, people, there was such a thing as privacy though. They weren't nearly as prudish in the medieval period because of just practicality. Sometimes it wasn't practical to have complete privacy. And so of course there, yeah. but sometimes people did want privacy and you could attain it. It wasn't out of the realms of possibility. The main situations in which water would become really contaminated from human waste specifically is when you get a large group of people, okay? Large towns and cities. Now, uh, this is another kind of thing that people think in, in medieval Europe, people just dumped their feet and poo onto the streets. And this comes from accounts about Britain, specifically London. I'm gonna, we'll shelve that, we'll come back to it because there's more nuance to that one as well because people think, well, because it happened here, it happened everywhere. No, uh, but all right. If, if you have a large town of people and they're dumping all their feces in the water, well, then it's gonna be contaminated. Did that mean people didn't drink it? Well, no, actually sometimes people did drink it and they got sick and they died a lot from it as well. There was a lot of death and sickness and one of the reasons was drinking contaminated water. But guess what? 
That's evidence of them drinking the water, not saying that they never drank the water, but sometimes they didn't. And in those situations, yeah, okay, making ale uh, would be a safer alternative. And that's where we can see instances of this happening, but not in all cases, all right? If you have, uh, if you're in a village or a town or in the country or anywhere, even if you're in a city, all right, if you have found a clean water source, you would of course drink it because water is convenient and you don't want to be drunk all the time. All right, dealing with human waste. Let's go in there because uh, we kind of branched off in it. And yes, in many instances, they dumped it in the water, but not in all instances, okay? Uh, of course, we saw that a lot in, you know, medieval London and even not just medieval London, like, like the industrial period later in London, uh, that the Thames, horribly contaminated. I mean, my goodness, you, and even today, I don't think you want to drink out of it, like, at all. In fact, most waterways near cities, you don't. Like, I just think of the Yarra in Melbourne, you know, near where I live. You don't want to drink out of it. But if I go up the hill a little bit and find a creek, generally the water is perfectly fine to drink. So, again, nuance, differences. Now, there are instances, recorded instances, of people dumping their crap and poo onto the streets, all right? but not in every instance. Now, again, this is another one of those things where I wish I was more prepared, but it takes time, okay? And uh, save me from doing a video in several years time. I'll do a follow on later when I, my knowledge has grown, but for now, I'll do what I can with what I have and what I know. And I have read of an account where people were charged, okay? It was a crime to dump feces on the street because these uh, people are people, all right? There are a couple of things that you can do. Poo smells, foul to us okay if it smells bad for us yes it smelled bad for our ancestors in the past they don't want to walk through crap on the street everywhere and so there were actual laws in some instances in place that had held penalties for people dumping their crap on the street because you don't want to smell it and you don't want to step in it all right and so the instances are like there is a street in london called s-h-i-t street okay because obviously people ignored the law there but that's not to say all throughout medieval London, there was poo on all the streets. No, okay? There was a thing called night watchmen. I mean, that was their job to collect poo. There was, in houses, they actually had poo pits, like cesspits and stuff in individual houses, and they'd be cleaned out weekly, if not daily, if you had enough money. Now, then they took it to the river and dumped it in the river, but they had organizations, okay? Like there was jobs to clean the poo out of the houses. They wouldn't need to do that if all the poo was being dumped on the street. So that's evidence that it wasn't always dumped on the street. <laughs> and the times when it was were those, you know, more specific events that, of course, were uh, it stood out more. You're going to notice a street with poo on it more than you know a street without. And so people made note of it. It gets recorded. And then when we read about it in the modern day, and they, everyone dumped poo on the street. No. It's just a couple of specific instances. And I'm quite confident it happened in many other places throughout medieval Europe and stuff like that where poo was dumped on the street in some places within different cities. But it wasn't a universal thing, okay? People don't like poo. They don't get it. They don't like stepping it. They don't like smelling it. They don't like getting it on their clothing, okay? And this is where we come to the next thing. Cleanliness in the medieval period. And people think they're all covered in dirt, mud, or crap. And interestingly, in the more recent video that kind of kicked this, I don't know, there are a lot of videos and, and documentaries that get this wrong. But the more recent one they mentioned that they, well, they, they incorrectly say that you know medieval people were covered in poo a lot and they didn't like bathing and they got sick and then later on they say oh contrary to common belief medieval people did bathe I mean they're contradicting their own video anyway so of course they, they bathed there were even public bathhouses so if you didn't have a big you know a wooden barrel or whatever to have a bath in or you weren't near a river because guess that's the other place you can have a bath in in natural waterways and you don't want to go in polluted waterways like in london things like that so they have bathhouses and there we go public bathhouses where people regularly went to get clean okay because people are people you can bad smells are bad smells you don't want to be around people who smell bad if or you don't want to smell bad it's harder to smell your own bad scent but anyway you can kind of infer that so you go to bathhouses in actual fact bathhouses uh, kind of uh, at one point i think it was in london got outlawed you can fact check me on this but got outlawed because a lot of the bathhouses were turning into brothels okay and you can see some pretty risque uh medieval artwork of people getting into some <laughs> interesting things in bathhouses and stuff so well there you go but 
evidence that bathhouses were very prominent, okay? And therefore, people like to bathe, they like to be clean, medieval people weren't always stinky and things. And it wasn't a luxury reserved to the rich, these bathhouses were available to everyone. And, and if, even if you couldn't afford it, you have access to clean water as well, and it doesn't take much to boil water to clean yourself up either, I mean, my goodness! And in another tangent to this about general cleanliness, stuff like that, medieval people loved colour, okay? Colourful clothing, in fact, the more colourful the more prestigious it was kind of so if you could afford purple which is why purple became a kind of a royal color because it was really expensive I mean you're really and uh, I people will say oh, it was outlawed I wonder how true that is I mean yeah. and if it was outlawed it would only be in a couple of kingdoms and nations maybe only in Britain things like so confirm this because if, if you can make purple and uh, you wanted to wear it, why not? You know, there was people who did make the dye. Why couldn't they wear purple? So was it, it comes into the thing about the long sword was being was outlawed. Uh, I'll go into the long sword next. But before I get into the long sword, let me finish up on the idea of colour. This might end up into a big video, but there's a lot to cover. Okay, when you say what was life like in the medieval period, I mean. That's a big subject, like people's lives are complex and elaborate and they do a lot of things, okay? So my goodness, uh, maybe I will only get to address the misconceptions. I might have to make uh, several follow-up videos to go into other things because it's... Uh, like, I love, there's things I love about the medieval period, and there's so, so things that just capture my interest, like swords and castles and knights, but then when I go into what life was like in this different time period, completely, it just enthralls me to try and understand, it's a different world, it's like you go into a different world and see how people live, it's amazing, and yet the, you can relate to them because they're still people, and you can actually understand there are weird practices that, from our perspective, might seem really strange and weird, but when you go in to understand it, it makes so much more sense, just like a, a classic example, medieval etiquette and rules around etiquette. So different to what we have in the modern day, but when you try and understand it, you figure out, for instance, if you had an itch to scratch, it was real, again, I don't know, I, I've, I've read this, uh, one account, and so I don't know how applicable it was, because of course, dining uh, etiquette would change between geographic locations. So I don't know, so don't think this is applying to the whole medieval period, it's not, but it's just one etiquette example that I have read about, and it's that if you had an itch, you wouldn't scratch it with your hands, because you ate with your, like in many situations, the food was communal, you'd go and grab it, and so if you scratched your face, you could get dirt or junk on your hands and then transfer it to food that other people ate from. So you would not scratch your face. If you had an itch, you would break off a bit of bread, scratch it with the bread, and then eat the bread, okay? And so this was a standard rule. And when you just hear about, like, if you have an itch, scratch with bread, why, why, why would you scratch an itch with bread? Well, it's again, it makes so much logical sense when you understand the context is that they ate a lot with their hands and it's a communal food and you don't want to pass on your germs. And so it's interesting, and they didn't really understand germs, but they understood cleanliness, okay? And so certain practices evolved around that. Okay, again, going back to colour, they loved colour, and so you're going to see lots of colour in clothing and in decoration, okay? Insides of medieval castles had beautiful murals. So when people say castles were dank, dark, and cold, and dreary, no, if you go in a real medieval castle, you will see just a huge explosion of colour with painted murals on the walls and everything like that. Because again, these are people. Like, if we look at this like, that's dark and dank, why would you want to live there? Perhaps that might be the same reaction that medieval people had in the medieval period, and so they would do something to change it. And guess what? They did, okay? Now, did every castle have painted murals on them? No, but a lot of them did. I Like, the more I studied the castles, that seems to be the general understanding that most castles, if they could get away with, was at least whitewashed with plaster, so they're white. They weren't just dark, dank stone, okay? They were white and plastered. And then if they had more money, there would be just at least patterns painted on them, maybe just like floral patterns with like branches and leaves and other things like that, to full-blown murals, uh, like just amazing things, okay? And again, it was a sign of wealth. The more fancy your inside of the castle, the more impressive and prestigious that you would be seen. So of course, they painted them a lot. And uh, it got more elaborate the more you go through medieval period to the point later, you could see some crazy fancy things with really fancy wood paneling and all that stuff. And if you go early in the medieval period, you're going to see whitewashed plaster or whatever uh, with more basic murals, but still murals. <laughs> Interesting practice that did happen. Again, uh, I know it happened in France in some cases, stuff like that. Depending on the type of stone was a reflection on how wealthy you were on the castle. And if you had a lord who could just build a basic castle with basic stone, okay, you know, yeah, yeah, um, they might want to be seen as more wealthy. And so 
castles were generally whitewashed on the outside because one, it looked more impressive and it was a protection against erosion. You could make uh, water resistant, you know, whitewash. I made a whole video on it. Why were castles white? There we go. So they did that and then they painted, so they whitewashed it and then they painted a stone pattern on the outside to make it look like it was made out of marble. And you can go into the inside of castles already stone, but they've whitewashed it, plastered it, and then they've painted stone on top of the actual real stone to make it look like more impressive stone. <laughs> See, people are funny, but it makes so much sense because status, prestige, and wealth are all so important to be seen, stuff like that. And so people wanted to keep up with their neighbours, keep up the Lord over there. People, it's interesting how different yet the same people are when you look at different historical periods. All right. Long swords. The reason why I bring up long swords is because people have said there were certain uh, situations in the past where the long sword was outlawed to the average person, the peasant. Okay, now that gets spread a lot. That uh, it, it gives me the impression that okay, there might be some validity in it somewhere. I have yet to find it. If you guys know of an actual historical reference from a document or something written in history that actually specified the longsword being outlawed for different lower classes of people, I would love to hear them because at this point I have never come across it, okay? I've come across many instances of average people using longswords that contradict it. And so if there was a situation where there was a law that outlawed longswords being carried by the average person, it would have only been some very small locations throughout medieval Europe. But in contrast to that, there are many cases where the average people carried long swords and they're very popular. And the cases I found are usually in the latter periods, in the medieval period, especially in Germany, but then you get things like the Kriegsmesser, like two-handed ones. But in Italy, I believe, uh, the average people started to love using long swords and carrying long swords and stuff. Uh, I think there's actually, it might be a full-blown misconception that the, the idea that the long sword was outlawed for regular people to carry, that might be a whole misconception. I'm kind of suspecting it, yet I haven't been able to confirm it yet. Hence the reason again why I was hesitant to make a video like this because my re my research isn't complete but then again it'll never be complete so I'll just like I said I'll do what I can with what I have and I believe this misconception has arisen out of the fact that the longsword is a two-handed weapon which means uh, you are not going to get the advantage of a shield so the situations in which you want to use a longsword is when you're wearing full plate armor but full plate armor or any heavy heavy enough armor it doesn't have to be full plate but okay heavy enough armor where you feel protected enough to not warrant the necessity of carrying a shield and so in that sense, the longsword, I believe, was associated with being of higher status, being the sword of the knight and chivalry and things. Because if you don't have full plate armor, you need a shield. And if you're going to have a shield, well, you need a one-handed sword over two-handed sword. And that is where, in my opinion, uh, that division created, the, the class distinction between the longsword, two-handed sword, and a one-handed arming sword. But then the arming sword became a really popular sword and buckler, and uh, that was kind of the average person combination. But it wasn't the case for the whole medieval period and every geographical location in the medieval period. Uh, so again, if you know the more specifics as to when it was happened, and even if there was a specific law, I'd love to know. I actually, at the moment, I'm not thinking there was. So once again, it's too many incorrect logical steps taken from something that, well, look, okay, rich people, a lot of the wealthier knights are using a two-handed longsword, a lot of the, you know, average goes one-handed swords. Well, I mean, that, that must oh, must happen because there was a law, because why wouldn't you want to use a, a two-handed sword if you could? So the people must have been outlawed when, no, it was probably just because armor and shields. Food. People say that food in the medieval period was all bland, tasteless, and blah. Now, of course, they had nowhere near the variety that we have in the modern day. We are so insanely spoiled in the modern day. We eat the food and variety, flavor, and uh, affordability that we have of food in the modern day is insane. We eat, literally, we eat better than the kings of the past. Even poor people eat better than the kings of the past in the medieval period with what they have available. Unless you're so poor you can't afford food, but I'm referring to more the poor of the first world countries, the Western world all right so the people of the, that level still eat incredibly well the poor of our modern day in first world countries are living better than the kings of the past and that is not an overstatement it, that is absolutely factual so Okay, does that mean all the food was bland? No, I mean, they had salt back then, okay? And salt's great at adding flavor to things. And uh, if they had enough salt to preserve things, they had salt in such abundance to bury things in salt and preserve them, which was one of the preservation methods, I don't think they were gonna be scrimping for salt to put on their food, okay? And then what are the types of things they eat? Well, I mean, all the things that you can grow, you can eat, okay? And so vegetables, 
vegetables, fruits, all those things are available to everyone. Meats can uh, get a little bit harder to get a hold of depending on how much wealth you have, but if you have access to water you can catch fish, okay? And so fish was a very prominent thing that the average person enjoyed. And uh, I mean, you think salmon is expensive now? Salmon was very common for the peasant, average person to eat in the medieval period. I found that in a couple of different sources, but one in the uh, like specific documentary said that fish was more reserved for the upper class people. I'm like, where did you, that's completely contrary to everything I've heard. But it was still a fairly well-respected documentary, so I'm not saying they can't get things wrong, they can, but they were actually sharing uh, an instance from the journal, the records of a medieval chef, and how he prepared his fish for his lord. And then they were saying, well, this was an up, it was only reserved for the lord. If they caught the fish, that was the lord's fish. And so again, I think we're seeing differences in geographical location and time period. And so fish might have been regarded with different pro prominence and, uh, you know, who got to, who, how affordable it was depending on time period and location and stuff. And so, of course, it varied. So when I say fish was prominent for less people, not all the time, there's differences. But of course, fish is always available. And the main meat they ate was pork. That one I've had a decent enough confirmation on. Pork was the main meat, okay? Beef, not so much, because cows are a beast of burden. You're either gonna be pulling it at a plow, if it's a, you know, an ox, or you're gonna be milking it if it's a cow, okay? And so you're gonna use it to the end of its life. Raising cattle just to, uh, like, fuel a beef industry, it's not really gonna happen. Uh, they did that with pigs for pork, and also lamb, but of course, sheep, provide wool, so they're not going to be slaughtering them for the sole case of eating it either. The most prominent meat was pork, and if you were a bit more wealthy, beef would be more available. And if you had a cow that reached the end of its life and then you slaughter it, then you'd have beef as well, of course. So it wasn't like no one ate it, but the most prevalent one was pork. And pork is great, okay? You make lots of things out of pork. Rabbit? Yeah, I, of course, rabbit. <laughs> well, prominent meats. Rabbit was huge, of course. And so there are so many different meats and there's a lot of variety. And I mean, there was cookbooks in the medieval period in creating different things. So to, to say that all food was bland and that, and look, there were times of gross starvation. I'm not saying there wasn't. But what about the times in between, okay? When there was times of plenty. And another thing people loved, pickled herring, okay? Uh, you know, more fish. And when it comes to exotic spices, that's when it gets more upper class, okay? Like peppers and cinnamon and all, all those things, okay? But it's funny, we might not really like many of the spices that the, uh, m you know, in the, the medieval upper class really enjoyed, because uh, uh, salt does a great job. And uh, so for the peasants, if they can salt their food and they have an, enough variety maker of different things, and they'll have, there'll be family recipes everywhere and all that stuff. There'll be plenty of variety and full bellies in times of plenty. And it's not, and it's not like everything was bland. Oh, and everything wasn't boiled either. I mean, the classic uh, pottage, okay, was very probably like anything that you cook in a pot and boil was pottage, okay. And there was pottages everywhere, but there would be different recipes with different ingredients, and so there was like, a large variety of pottages, and of course pies and you know pastries and all that stuff. And if you're wondering about sweetness, okay, where do they get their desserts and stuff? Though they didn't have refined sugar like we have in the modern day, they have honey and they have fruits. All right, add those into recipes, you can get a a lot of sweetness, so apple tarts and all those things, of course they existed, okay? People like to eat. Well, one, we need to eat, and because we need to eat it, we want to make it enjoyable, and so we're gonna find ingredients that we like, and again, it's not like people didn't have taste buds in the medieval period, and the types of, the ways that they cooked. I've heard people say that I was always over a f open fire, okay? Ovens. I mean, you can make an oven out of dirt for crying out loud, let alone brick and stone. I mean, and it's, it's actually really sophisticated the way that they develop, uh, like how to control temperature and stuff. Remember how I said stone has bad insulative properties? It's capable of absorbing huge amounts of thermal mass and then retaining it for, when I say a while, like a good couple of hours. I mean, if you create like a stone castle and it absorbs all that sunlight, that heat in the stone from the day is going to dissipate in a few hours to the night and it'll get kind of cold which is why you need a fire. So it's not like it traps the heat and stays it all night. But those few hours where it is able to retain like really high amounts of heat is how they worked ovens, okay? They would set the fire in the oven and then they would like let the fire burn out or pull or just drag all the fire out, drag all the coals. There's no fire in the oven at all, but there is such heat retained in the bricks or the stone that that's when they put in the pastry, the bread, 
Bread was by far one of the most prominent things people ate, by the way. I was talking about all these things and everything's like bread, absolutely. And you know what you like to eat with bread? Butter, <laughs> okay? Milk, butter and everything. And then they can create other things to combine with bread, dipping sauces and all that stuff, always prominent. And by the way, have you ever eaten fresh bread? I mean, the stuff you buy from the shops doesn't even compare. Fresh, properly made good bread, delicious. And uh, the peasants would actually be eating wholemeal bread because to grind the flour into what we would call white flour takes even more work and therefore more expensive. And so white breads, the more unhealthy kind, was actually reserved for the upper class, the nobility. And in actual fact, the from studying different um, uh, you know, cooking recipes and other things in the medieval period, we find that the higher class of people had worse diets than the lower class of people. The lower class of people had better diets, eating more healthy food, and will probably be stronger and healthier, funny thing. Uh, then there's other, I mean, disease and infection and thing generally led to people's deaths. I'm not saying they lived really long lives, but anyway. Side note. And so going back to the oven, they take out all the heat and there's so much heat in the oven, that's when they put in the bread and stuff. And just the heat in the bricks and the stone is of such strength that they can retain it. And that's how they can control temperature because like, they will lower at a fairly gradual rate, but stay fairly consistent. And so if it's too hot, they'll wait and they put it in and then they can time or just keep an eye on when the, whatever is in there is cooked and done. And so they had sophisticated ways of cooking things. It wasn't just over an open fire pit, you know? And you can do a lot with an open fire pit, all right? So there's that. People working all day, every day, and life is nothing but work. N not really, okay? I mean, if most of the people in the medieval period were farmers, all right, do you farm all times of the year? There will be times in the year in which the work would be crazy, like uh, uh, plowing the field and planting, okay? Planting the seed. Once you've plowed and planted, what do you have to do? You just need to wait until it to grow. So look, there might be weeding, there might be keeping pests out and all these things, but once that work is done, you have a fairly decent, you know, gap of time in good weather as well, in which you're not needing to farm, okay? And then comes harvest time, and that would be crazy, crazy work, 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 store it all away, you have your stores for the winter, you're good to go, and of course you'll separate grain seed and other things like that, and uh, all right, then you hit the winter. Then what? Okay, there's actually a lot of time in between the main crazy work things if for an average farmer, and that leaves them room to do other things. Maybe they need want to help build a barn, okay, or they want to build a, a mill, or a, let alone building. If they have animals, okay, animals would uh, increase the work, and every every medieval home would at least have a garden. Every. Not every, sorry, a lot, of course, would have a garden bed and a couple of animals, especially an animal to milk chickens for eggs and other things like that. So taking care of the animals would be a fairly regular thing. But the idea that it was always work, backbreaking labor, and no one did everything, like creates the impression that life must be horrible in the middle of food. No, there are times in which you didn't need to work as much as other times. And in actual fact, they almost have a bit more freedom than we might consider in the modern day. There's this idea in the modern day of wage slaves and I feel there is some validity to it, but I still feel there is choice and there is a way to break outside of the wage system. But you have to be ambitious, you do have to have opportunity and education, all these are things that play into the thing about breaking out of the wage slave thing. But if you compare the, the wage slave to people in the medieval time, you had a lot of freedom and choice to choose what you wanted to do in between the times when you needed to work. And sometimes that would be more work, but it might be things that you're interested in. What if you had an interest in craft and you wanted to uh, start carpentry or something like that? And, you do, and by the way, people do carpentry because they enjoy it. And so there's a lot of people who would have taken up a craft because they loved it and they enjoyed it and then they're not really working a day in their life, okay? And there are other things. What if you wanted to plant a vineyard to make wine and stuff like that? Or if you wanted to start to, you know, um, uh, get you know, fibres from uh, your wool or whatever and turn it into fibres, make clothes or, or linen or you grow flax, turn that into linen and make linen sheets. And, uh, 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 or you wanted to create cheese and stuff and so all these options were available to you and you got to choose what you wanted to do, what you liked. And if you like cheese, making cheese, well, you probably enjoyed doing that. And then you could sell the produce that you had, you know, at the local market or whatever, and you might focus on one kind of thing. And then in between the moments of work and stuff, well, there were festivals everywhere in the medieval period. They loved to party, okay? And then they also, they loved games. And not only, they, they not only loved games, they loved story and song, okay? So singing, the idea of the bard or the troubadour, 
you know, the storytelling and stuff like that. People took that up as a, pro as a profession because it was so enjoyed. And that didn't mean that they had to wait for, a, you know, a troubadour or whatever to come through to tell a story. There would be the local story, like, heck, everyone would know stories and they'd love to share stories about King Arthur or, or George and the Dragon or whatever, right? Or Zigfried and the Dragon. I, I get them confused. Uh, but, all, like, these stories that have survived to the modern day came from back then, okay? And they would be sharing them one to the other. And, you know, it, it's interesting. Even if we go to, like, the 1800s, the practice of dramatic storytelling, like, was something fairly prominent. I learned about this from the fact that my sisters and my mum loved, uh, what is it? Anne of Green Gables. That's the one, okay? And, uh, and there's a part in Anne of Green Gables where the character does a dramatic telling of a story as a presentation of, I don't know, it was like a talent show or it was just some event and then she chose to do that and it was actually really common and mum would, my mum actually related to me that, yeah, there was a lot of kind of things like that and uh, that was just an uh, interesting, like people created means of entertainment for them that are foreign to us because we've got TV and things like that, but telling stories in a communal setting was uh, a very common thing not that far back in history it was still being done. And so in the medieval period, absolutely. So much so that people could devote their entire profession to it if they wanted. Sometimes people wanted to travel to see other parts in the world, and absolutely they did, and people created things for people to travel to to be seen because tourism, there was even tourism trades back then, and usually it was like in uh, religious artifacts or the bones of certain saints and things like that. People would travel over very far distances to have a look at it, but by traveling, you would get to see the world and be an adventurous kind of thing, and, and you could do it as a regular peasant. It wasn't restricted to the upper class and stuff like that. People like to do things. Travel, go on holiday, okay? You are still, if you, even if you're a peasant or serf, you could still do that, all right? The world was an adventurous thing with lots of entertainment and joys to be found. There were harsh things, just like there's harsh things in the modern day that we have to deal with, heartache and sorrow, pain, suffering, loss of life, and all these things. Life can be really tough, yet there are times when it can be really good as well. And that was just the same in the medieval period as it is in the modern day. It wasn't abject misery. If it was abject misery constantly, everyone would have committed suicide and we wouldn't even exist in the modern day. I mean, no one would be left alive to, you know, have you know, descendants, children, and stuff like that. No, and that family life is a joy as well. People loved having children. People loved getting married, okay? These are all wondrous things. So even if you were a peasant and you weren't the upper class riches of the rich, you could still live a fulfilling, happy life with many joys in between. And some and work didn't have to be a misery either, okay? Especially if you got to choose your work, think something that you loved or had the freedom to and just see the results of building things. You know, things need to be understood in context. And look, this video is already massively long, so I, I, I have to end it there because of time. There are still things that I could have mentioned and gone into, so perhaps follow-up video, I'll do more later on. And especially as my knowledge grows and I learn more, more new things. But the takeaway from this, I hope that the, if you were to take away one thing, you'll take away this, is that a lot of the things, the quirky things you might hear about the medieval period, more often than not, it was only uh, like a more restricted kind of event practice or that happened and it wasn't necessarily broadly applicable. And even if it was more broadly applicable, it needs to be understood in context because there's context to everything, okay? So if people say the medieval period was like this and it was just like that with no other nuance to it, yeah, you can be a little bit skeptical in that regard. So thank you for watching. I hope you have enjoyed. I have done <laughs> an adequate job because it's a long rambly video. There's a lot to cover and there's a lot I didn't cover. But anyway, I hope you've enjoyed. Thank you for watching. And of course, I hope to see you again. So until that time, farewell.